be dealing with topics on climate, acid deposition, water quality, mercury, and soils. And our speakers begin with Dr. Leslie dupigny Giraud, who's the Fort Vermont State Climatologist. And Dr. Giraud's research interests intersect a number of interdisciplinary fields, including hydroclimatic natural hazards and climate literacy, as well as the use of remote sensing and GIS in the fields of spatial climate and land surface processes. Following her will be Rich Perot, and Rich is a member of the VMC Technical Advisory Committee and a longtime VMC cooperator. He is the section chief for the Air Quality and Climate Division within the Agency of Natural Resources and the Department of Environmental Conservation. He also serves on the U.S. EPA Science Advisory Board and the U.S. EPA Council for Clean Air Compliance Analysis. Uh, following Rich will be Jim Kellogg, and Jim is a aquatic biologist, also with the Department of Environmental Conservation within ANR, and also a member of the VMC Technical Advisory Committee. He monitors water bodies ranging in size from vernal pools to big rivers, assessing acute changes and more chronic trends in waters resulting from acid atmospheric deposition and land use disturbances. Following Jim will be Jamie Shanley, and Jamie is a research hydrologist and bio, biogeochemist with the USGS and has worked in Vermont in with uh, VMC since 1991. He's a long-term VMC cooperator, and his active re research centers on mercury and organic transport by streams. And finally, we have Scott Bailey, and Scott is a geologist with the U.S. Forest Service, and although he is classified as a geologist, he prefers the term uh, geoecology to describe his work. Scott is interested in the influence of substrate, including soil, geologic parent material, landforms, and water on the structures and functions of ecosystems. So starting off will be Dr. Leslie Ann dupigny Giraud. Good morning, everybody. My talk's really, really easy because everybody else mentioned everything I was going to say anyway. <laughs> so Nancy started with the fact that we've been in a particularly warm period and everybody's enjoying the warmth out there compared to what we had last year. We're also in a particularly dry period, which as you've heard from Barb and from, um, oh dear, I just blanked on his name. Yeah, Josh that we have a particularly moisture stress issue in terms of, of our forests. So what I thought I would do is to take a, a systems approach to looking at climate and looking at the ways in which various aspects of the climate system actually are important for, for forest health and for forest productivity. So when a climatologist thinks about uh, the climate as a system, we're looking at all the various components including temperature and precipitation, but also relative humidity, um, all of the, the fluxes that take place between the land and the atmosphere, the oceans and the, the water bodies, and how those all sort of come together either concurrently or individually to, to either stress or to, to assist with forest production. And so one of the ones that we hear about in other contexts is, of course, tropospheric ozone or ground level ozone. And when we think about the ways in which that is of importance to our species, I know Rich might actually be talking about this two people down from me in terms of how does that, um, how do those concentrations actually influence things like uh, species vulnerability to insects and diseases. So moisture is one of the big pieces that is critically important to us. And when I say moisture, we're talking about not just pre precipitation, but some of the effects of precipitation as well. And this is a sort of a busy graph. Can you see this OK, or is this just a bunch of lines and no? You see it okay? Okay, so you've got the green lines on here which show you the precipitation from 1895 up until 2015. The red line is a, a smooth binomial filter that shows you the sort of changes over time in a smooth fashion. And you'll notice on the left-hand side, this is the annual value. And on the right-hand side, what I've done is to pull out just the seasonal value for September to, to November. So if you only looked at annual values, you would, you would see that things have been increasing over time with that nice big dip 
in the 1960s, which is a critical time because it was a very long-term um, decade of both drought as well as cold conditions. So that has an influence in terms of not just your, fro your forest health, but it has a, an implication for monitoring as well, because if you started in that time frame, everything would look like it's always going up from there. So knowing what the, the, the sort of initial conditions are critically important. Now, on the right-hand side, where you have that um, sort of fall time frame, we're, we're seeing moisture decreases in the fall. And whenever I show these types of diagrams to agriculturalists and I ask them if this makes a difference, they say yes, because it, it, it helps to, to, to have a, a clearer sense of what they should be planting and what should be going on over winter. So looking at a seasonal time frame is, is always critically important in uh, a moisture context. So Barb talked a lot about drought, and we can see some of the various aspects um, that drought sort of plays, both in terms of whether it's a summer drought, uh, a spring drought, which is what you've got on the lower right here with all these grass fires. The uh, diagram here on the left is, is the effect of grout, drought with leaves scorched on your sugar maples, and these are just some um, corn crops that I took about 18 years or so. The other thing about drought is that Vermont has this, this tendency to flip between moisture extremes, between drought conditions and really wet conditions. And so sometimes in some years you actually have either consecutive stresses going on or coincident stresses going on. And you've got uh, your tar spot on, on your Norway maples across in here at the same time as you have some of that leaf scorch taking place. So, so knowing what's, what's going on in terms of moisture stress is critically important. And when you think about tropical storm Irene four years ago, it had a couple different impacts in terms of moisture excess, but also as a disturbance factor because when you add eight inches of precipitation to an environment that was already saturated, then you had the additional um, complication of trees being upended totally by the boles. So when you, when you look at, at some of these moisture events, it's not just the actual number, but the sort of coincident or subsequent impact that, that um, is of importance. So, Irene could be considered a disturbance, but we can think of other types of disturbances, and, and the types of them and the effects of them are not always equal. So um, Paul talked a lot about ice storms, and when we think about ice storms, it's uh, a function of, of not just how long the, the, the icing was in place, but also the amount of icing that you're talking about and the various species that tend to be particularly prone to icing. So if it occurs in some, something like now, you know, November, December time frame, the leaves are off and it's only like an inch, you'll have a very, very different impact than what we had in the sort of three to four inch icing event that we had in, in 1998 in that particular um, ice event. And especially when an ice event is followed by another type of stressor, like excessive snowfall, then you have a double whammy in terms of, of your, your, your tree health. Um, because I'm a climatologist, I had to sneak this one in here. A different way of looking at, at disturbances are more on a, a sort of micro scale, more localized scale. And we think about microbursts, downbursts, and the effects of those. And those tend to be sort of straight line winds that you would see in isolated patches in the forest. And speaking of isolated winds, we also get very, very high winds, especially at, at the upper elevations. And when you get into these types of sort of 55 to 72 miles per hour, you're actually approaching hurricane force winds. And the, the sort of damage that occurs on the tree tops of your, in the canopy structure would be different than if you were talking about um, more larger scale wind events. So I can't talk about climate without talking about temperature. And when we talk about temperature, again, um, ways of kind of thinking about this, what I've put on here on the left-hand side is um, average temperatures, but those don't tell the story completely. And so on the right-hand side, I have minimum temperatures, again, from 1895 to 2015. And I specifically picked what we call shoulder seasons, so the spring season and the fall season, because those are the ones where that um, proneness to stress actually gets set up a little bit more. So you've got November on the upper part of the diagram and May on the lower part of the diagram. These are some of the things that Paul would be particularly interested in when he's, he's looking at sort of frost damage and um, winter injuries and the effects of that moving into the spring. So we can talk about summertime stressors, we can talk about wintertime stressors. Are they good? Sometimes. You can have uh, heat waves and drought being good if you were following a particularly wet year and, and things sort of dry out as a result of that. And in the wintertime, um, you've, you've heard from Paul in terms of uh, going to, to, to freezing conditions in terms of your soils and what that means for things like red spruce. 
Um, from an economic perspective, our last speaker talked about um, the, the role of the forest in, in the economy. And when we, we think about frost damage, it's not only to our hardwoods like our sugar maples, but also to our balsam fir, which is critically important for our, our Christmas tree industry here in the state. Now, when we move from the sort of larger forests and get into the shrubs, one of the things that we can look at is things called backward seasons, which means that instead of warming up in the spring, you're actually cooling down and actually getting frost or snowfall or other conditions like that. And we've seen that uh, for the last few years or so. We didn't see it this year. But when that sort of uh, condition is in place, it also has implications for your, 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 your tree health as well. So this is to sort of prep for, for Jen's talk coming up this afternoon when she's going to take us into looking ahead to some of the conditions from a climate change perspective. And when we heard Josh talk about the increase in growing season length, if you see the upper diagram here, um, what we're looking at is two different things across the, the, the state in terms of a, a projected increase in the next uh, 30 to 40 years or so with uh, a sort of 20 to 25 degrees. Um, number of days increase in the lower part here and across the northern part of the state that's sort of 25 to 27 increase in days in the frost free season. Why do we care about that? Well we know some of the reasons but I just wanted to throw out a couple more in terms of changes in the, in the carbon cycle that would occur as your, your freeze free season in, increases but to sort of temper that with the fact that we're not only talking about temperature here we also sort of need to keep in mind a couple of the other coincident stresses like your forest fires, your pest invasions, and your summer drought. So to kind of wrap this up, and this is the quickest that I've ever talked, and I hope you're still <laughs> listening to me. Yes, you're laughing, so you're actually hearing me. Um, a lot of the things that you've actually heard across this morning are just mirrored in these last take-home messages, that role and, in, in, and importance of a regionality, the tremendous amount of both spatial and temporal variability that we see. This whole climate system is uh, non-linear approach um, and there are a lot of things that we still don't understand, a lot of work left to be done so there's a lot of please to, to please um, come on board and join us and some of these MCAS can be sort of species specific but I think it's a great time to continue our monitoring activities so we can get to that great place. So thank you.